My name is Winton Higgins and I'm a writer and academic living in Sydney. My new novel is called Rule of Law and it is about the first Nuremberg trial which um, took place between uh, October 1945 and uh, about the same time in 1946. Now, um, as an academic, I've had a specialisation in genocide studies and in particular uh, research and writing about the Holocaust. So that is how I began to take notice of the Nuremberg trial, about which I had great misconceptions at the beginning and it was uh, a fascinating uh, research effort to get, uh, get up to speed to the point where I could write a novel about it. Um, I set out to write a, a novel about something which was a great human drama, which had enormous consequences uh, for the world in general and for um, Germany in particular. Now, uh, I've got a particular take on how you uh, write historical fiction of this kind, where you're not just using history and historical events as a backdrop, but you're actually writing a novel about them. So, um, but just about all the characters in my novel and all the events in the novel stick strictly to the historical record. Uh, there are a few non-historical characters in it uh, and whatever I have created or imagined for the novel uh, does not in any way contradict the historical record. Uh, so the, the trial itself arose out of a particular historical uh, predicament. In uh, 1943, the main allies, Germany, sorry, the main allies, uh, France, uh, Britain, the Soviet Union and the USA uh, published a communique in which they promised to pursue and punish those uh, Germans who had committed um, at, world, at world's end, at the, w at the end of the World War, uh, atrocities against uh, civilians and against uh, POWs. So the, the purpose of that communique was simply to try and scare the, uh, the perpetrators off, to try and ameliorate the ongoing atrocities that they were committing. Now a year later, when the end of the war was in sight, uh, the Allies had to try and figure out what they actually were going to do to honour this promise. The major um, and the most popular suggestion was that you simply draw up a list of major war criminals uh, and once they've been arrested you just hand them over to firing squads. Um, the minority opinion was that they should actually face a, a proper judicial proceeding before any kind of punishment is handed out. Now um, the person who uh, actually pushed this, the, the idea of a trial along was Henry Stimson, Secretary of War under Roosevelt in the United States. Uh, and uh, he was a very cunning politician. He was able to get his way. And uh, he also set up uh, an extraordinary think tank in the Pentagon to figure out how this trial should work and what it should achieve. Now, what they wanted to do was um, set a precedent that would completely change international law uh, in relation to state crimes and uh, those who exercised national sovereignty. There's, they wanted to completely abolish impunity for any crimes committed anywhere by anyone. And this was a very revolutionary proposition, but it was baked into the charter of the International Military Tribunal that came to sit in Nuremberg in judgment on 22 uh, Nazi perpetrators. So uh, the trial was more about this 
uh, visionary idea than it was about actually dealing with these 22 miscreants. So um, what, uh, what happened then was that uh, they looked for a, a venue. The venue was Nuremberg, a little bombed out, isolated city in Germany. Uh, part of the United States uh, area of occupation and then it needed about 5,000 functionaries, journalists uh, and um, uh, correspondents and newsreel people to keep this, to keep the trial going. On top of that, uh, it was going to run in four languages, which meant that um, the whole business of simultaneous interpreting had to be invented just so the trial could occur. So uh, the scene was set for a massive human drama. A lot of these people who were shipped into Nuremberg uh, were themselves very traumatised by the war, uprooted and very fragile people. The four, um, the four countries who were sponsoring the trial, uh, the USSR, France, Britain and America, all ran on different kinds of um, uh, legal traditions, legal concepts and procedures, and somehow the trial had still to be conducted in an orderly way so as to guarantee um, that there was due process. It, if there was not due process, if this was not a fair trial, uh, then it would simply not be the precedent that Stimson and his, um, uh, and his experts were planning on. So what I've done uh, in following this huge human drama is uh, select four um, characters, point of view characters, through whose eyes and ears and emotions the trial ran. The first one, uh, Richard Zonnenfeld, uh, is a um, young German-Jewish uh, refugee who ended up, at the, when the war ended, he was um, in the American Army of Occupation in, uh, in Austria actually, and was recognised for his talents as, uh, as an interpreter and became part of the US uh, prosecution team. The, um, the second character is Hans Fritscher, who was the head of German radio during the Third Reich, uh, in charge of uh, propaganda essentially under Goebbels who couldn't stand trial because he'd already committed suicide. The third character and in some ways the main character is Katharina Thornton who was a uh, young German war widow with a child um, who, um, who got caught up in the British invasion of northwest Germany uh, and in the process she um, met and, and married an Australian RAF officer. The two of them come to Nuremberg. He, as a member of the uh, British uh, prosecution team, she as one of the pioneer simultaneous interpreters. Now she is also um, mixed, she was also mixed up in the plot to assassinate Hitler of 20th of July, 1944. Uh, and she is a German nationalist. So she sees in the trial not just what Stimson and the others want, but a way of cleansing Germany of its toxic, uh, of its toxic tribalism uh, and uh, laying the basis for a new kind of German national identity. So these characters uh, go through the ebbs and flows of a trial that is in, in many ways makeshift, full of uh, points of danger and uh, points where it, the whole thing could have simply fallen over. But um, uh, what I've tried to do is, is contrast their different experiences uh, of what was happening in the trial, the main, the main personalities involved in it, uh, and of course the outcome. Uh, so, uh, let me just um, talk about, just say a few words about um, what I discovered about uh, 
creative writing and particularly historical uh, novel writing. There are, there are obviously two kinds of historical novels. There are the kind of the uh, love among the ruins kind of uh, trials, uh, uh, novels where really the, um, the, the historical events are just some sort of a, a backdrop. Then there's the kind that um, I've tried to um, uh, produce, um, which try to get at the drama of uh, the historical events themselves in a sense of dissatisfaction with the way you read these things in historical straightforward history books uh, where you know the characters are just stick figures wandering across the page uh, whereas they you know the real actors were not stick figures they were real human beings with real private needs uh, real traumas and um, uh, and real ambitions so this is what I've tried to um, bake into this novel and I think that it, you know, all the normal concerns of novel writing come up then. Uh, the most basic point then is um, the craft of writing itself. Uh, there seems to be a lot of people who think that because they can write uh, an email or an official report or a legal opinion that therefore they can uh, write a novel and one of the most humbling experiences one can have is to uh, is to enroll in a creative writing course and realize how much you don't know about the art of creative writing so I guess my heartfelt advice to um, emerging writers is to enroll in a creative course a creative writing course and to keep on enrolling on them no matter how far down the track you think you've come. There's a great old uh, Zen expression, if you think you're getting somewhere, go back to the beginning. And I think that very much applies to the art of creative writing uh, as well.